Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, great to see everybody here. Great to see so many young people here, as uh, President Dunn and uh, the governor mentioned earlier. This is a really excellent event, and uh, I'm proud to be part of it. On behalf of Sadaral, our 300 graduates and current class members, uh, we develop leaders for our communities and for agriculture in South Dakota. Uh, I'm going to very quickly move our panel along here, if that's okay with you. Uh, I am going to encourage you to stay during lunch and during the networking time at the end to talk with these individuals personally. They have great stories to tell about how they got into and stayed in agriculture in South Dakota and in uh, uh, Minnesota. Uh, these are the people who used to be these people not too awfully long ago. And there are gonna be many connections that you can make. Let me start with uh, right here, Adam. Adam Krause, fourth generation farmer from Clear Lake. He and his family run a diversified crop farm and uh, with uh, corn, soybeans, wheat, and oats, as well as they raise pigs for supreme pork. And uh, Adam is the 2018 Pig Farmers of Tomorrow by the National Pork Board. I want to be his PR person when I grow up. Uh, next to uh, Adam is uh, Kevin Dinert. Kevin grows 2,500 acres of soybeans, corn, and alfalfa, raises beef cattle alongside his dad and brother on their farm in Mount Vernon, and he's on the Soybean Association here in South Dakota. Uh, Derek Crochel uh, and his family run Chandler Feed Company, a thriving feed and grain elevator company, five locations in southwest Minnesota. That sounds like a commercial right there, doesn't it? With five locations to serve you throughout southwest Minnesota. Uh, eight million bushels of grain storage, delivering thousands of pounds of feed every day for swine, dairy, beef, poultry, and sheep operations in the area. Jared Nock, oh, I skipped Brooke. You guys are sitting out of order. You threw me for a loop. Let me go to Brooke Heisinger first. Uh, Brooke and her husband farm near Scotland, run a diverse livestock operation, which includes a feedlot, hog barn, and cattle. She's a member of the Growing American Farmers and Ranchers Agrovision's Beginning Farmer Program. And Jared Nock is a graduate of our program, farms near Willow Lake. He raises 180 cow-calf pairs, contracts 3,300 hogs for Smithfield, and founded Dakota Vision Ag, which sells AI and cattle reproductive services, among other things. Welcome, great to see everybody. And I'm gonna start, uh, I think, with Adam. Let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, how you ended up on the farm. And, and I, I say that kind of flippantly, but uh, there was a time you were thinking, eh, maybe I'm not going to go back to the farm, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, I guess growing up, I, that's, that's every kid's dream, it seems like, growing up on the family farm and, and maybe being able to, to fill in those shoes someday. But, um, you know, with, with commodity prices and land prices and, and um, with things going the way they are, it seems like in the... La in the uh, ag industry, things are getting harder, times are getting tougher, and so you need to be able to think outside the box and bring something home to the table, and wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do that right away, so um, came to South Dakota State University, decided that I was going to see what I could do to um, get a job and develop a skill, um, maybe outside the, off the farm for a while, and see if that opportunity arose eventually. So how did you end up then back on the farm? How did that all work out with your family? So... Um, Junior year, right when I was doing my semester tests one winter, uh, my dad called me and said, what are you doing over Christmas break? And I said, obviously coming home and working on the farm, kind of like I usually do. But uh, I guess that kind of changed when he said, well, we need to talk. Maybe you want to look at building a nursery barn. And I kind of stepped back and wondered how that was going to go. So um, after some careful planning, talking to a lot of different people, um, bankers, pig farmers, um, Livestock producers all alike um, decided that that would be a pretty good opportunity to and punch my ticket and be able to come back home to the family farm. Yeah, so what did you learn from that? Um, <laughs> <laughs> a couple of learning things along the way there, right? A lot, absolutely. Um, growing up with pigs all my life, um, my dad always had finisher barns, so that was something different. Um, you know, getting a pig at 60 pounds is a lot different than getting a pig at 14 pounds. Learned that very early on. Um, but also different family aspects as well. Um, a lot of banking and financial things get thrown into that um, and always making constant adjustments no matter if that's in the barn or in the finances or having conversations with your family that way. Yeah. 
Uh, let me jump over to Kevin. Uh, Kevin, 2,500 acres of soybeans, corn, alfalfa, and beef cattle. Have the family already always been in cattle? Yeah, we, uh, sorry. We always been in the cattle business. Um, I grew up with a cow-calf operation, smaller feedlot, and uh, we gradually have been expanding as resources and land are available. But yeah, we, ever since, you know, I'm sure like a lot of you, you know, growing up, you always remember 4-H, being with cattle and then slowly working your way into having a part on the day-to-day -day chore life and all that. So who, who farms on your farm? Who's, who's involved? So it's uh, myself, my brother, older brother, and my father. Well, three of us farm together. A differing amount of shares into what we have there. Okay, so how does all that work? <laughs> how often do you talk? <laughs> uh, some days, every day, you know, let, let, I don't say some days every day, every day. Um, a lot of hard talks, um, whether it be uh, first coming back, uh, you got to have that hard talk about what you hope to accomplish, what they hope from the gain from you, and where do you see your uh, program going. So every day is a constant uh, communication channel. Where, where do we see our farm going? How are we going to better ourselves, better our farm, and for our families? And uh, just how, how are we going to accomplish that? So every day is a communication day. I mean, there's nothing that goes around from excessive communication between basically partners in an operation. Sounds like you had to bring something to the table. It wasn't just a, oh, yeah, come on, Kevin, you gotta just join us. Well, yeah, the first, when they first wanted me there, like, oh, yeah, there's another free labor source. And, <laughs> oh, you, you wanted to get paid for that. Huh? Yeah, so you, you kind of quickly have to have that conversation that I am not in high school and working for a supper anymore. Uh, I'm here as a partner in the operation and I kind of want to uh, further my life in that. Mm -hmm. What would you do differently now? Some things that I'd kind of do differently. Um, I think when I first came, you know, you had those hard conversations and, and you had them right up front, but just kind of uh, a map of where you want to go. Uh, kind of bring to them either some numbers or figures and say, hey, this is where I want to be, uh, five-year plan, 10-year plan, and this is how I want to accomplish that. And how is that going to fit into our operation currently? How are we going to make those changes? Do we need to increase land for crops, or are we going to accomplish that by maybe diversifying and say some other type of animals, or, or just expand of what we currently have? Mm -hmm. Have you, have you expanded your land? Uh, we currently rent out a few more acres than we have before, but we've also turned some of those acres into a larger feedlot area so that we can accommodate myself and my brother into having a better share of that farm. Was that your plan? Part of it. Good. Part of it was my father. As in, like a lot of fathers, they want to see their sons grow within the operation. And, uh, but, you know, he doesn't know that until you tell him. And you got to have that conversation with them that, hey, I want to be here for the long haul. And once they figure that out, they're willing to accommodate you too. So you've added animals then to your, you've added livestock. Yes, we've grown our cow-calf herd substantially, uh, obtained some new pasture land to accommodate that, and also just our feedlot operation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you're always looking how to operate that feedlot, and it's not always the same thing year after year, but how you're going to manage that feedlot in terms of what are you feeding, uh, what type of animal, and uh, say what age of animal, and so on and so forth. Less capital involved in the feedlot, huh, than if you had to go out and buy acreage. Yes, yeah, it, it certainly helps that there was already some infrastructure in place, mm -hmm. and, uh, but again, your, your time is free, and so you got to make uh, hard choices on how you want to spend that money and into, you know, what type of animals you want to purchase. And it helps to have, a, you know, a father and, and a brother already in the operation to bounce ideas off of and they be able to kind of back you on some things. Good, good. Pass the microphone over to uh, Derek. Derek Rochelle, uh, you're, the, you're the feed guy here. You probably love livestock, don't you? Yeah, we uh, have a pretty good passion for it. Tell us about your operation. Tell, tell us how it how it started, how it's grown. Um, my grandpa started it as a hatchery in uh, 1946, actually. And 
decided that he could make his own feed and that kind of just evolved into one thing after another and then uh, became more in the commercial feed business in the 70s and 80s when my dad joined in and then uh, in 2003 we ended up buying uh, two more locations, uh, grain elevators. So that kind of put us on the map as a grain elevator. I should back up. Uh, 1996, we built a brand new feed mill and uh, allowed us to produce a lot more tons and more efficiently. And then we bought the other locations. And then in 2009, we bought the other uh, elevator in town, which had another feed mill. So then we could do a little more species specific uh, feed. And recently, this summer, we bought two more locations and one is another feed mill uh, just 10 miles south. So we will have a swine mill and then uh, dairy beef and then uh, we do a calf feed mill also. How many family members do you have involved in that operation? Uh, there's five owners. Um, I also have some in-laws that work for us. So I have eight different relative, close relatives that I work with on a day-to-day -day basis. How does that work for you? Uh, lots of communication. <laughs> so I'm the youngest of all of them, and they put me in charge, so I don't know what they're <laughs> thinking. But That, that communication theme kind of kind of comes through. So tell us about livestock development. What does that look like in Minnesota? We're, we're getting pictures of it here in South Dakota. It's uh, For Chandler Feed, it's changed a lot in the last uh, 10 years even. Um, in 2003, we bought the grain elevators, and uh, that's kind of what got me back in the business was I had a passion for basis trading and trading grain, and I went to school at South Dakota State for animal science, so it was kind of a mixed passion, but we were kind of 50-50 grain and also in the livestock business. Well, we used to export corn out of Chandler to get empty for fall. Now we get to July and we're importing corn in for the feed mill. So our usage has gone up dramatically and our, uh, our basis is getting closer, like Dr. Toller talked about, to Sioux Center. I think actually today I'm posted the same number as Sioux Center, so. Wow. Um, very good, well, um, pass, pass the microphone over if you, if you could to, uh, uh, to Brooke. Um, Brooke, tell, tell me the story, tell us the story of how you and your husband got back on the farm. Okay. Uh, my husband, we were dating in high school. Originally, uh, I really wasn't interested in the farm, but I was the oldest and my dad needed help, so I started working on the farm. Uh, Jared and I dated a couple years and he started working for my dad, and I kind of decided that, yeah, I like, I like being on the farm, I like working with Jared. And it really hit me when I was heading to college that I will never be able to replicate what I learned on the farm, whether it be my work ethic or just the make nothing or make something of nothing attitude. So Jared and I both went to SDSU and at that point my dad was like, okay, we need to do something so I can not only raise two more kids and support my family, but also support your family. So that is how we got into the hog business. Uh, he built two 2,500 head hog finishing barns and expanded the feedlot. Um, Jared and I both graduated then, we came back. Jared runs the hog barns. And right out of college, I worked for Sioux Nation, which is a vet clinic, and I was basically working full-time there and then full-time on the farm. I was presented with a great opportunity to be a credit analyst at the bank in Tyndall, uh, Security State Bank. And at that point, I had a hard talk with my dad and my husband, and I just said, if I keep working full-time on the farm and another job, I will get burned out very quick, and it'll be with the farm, and that is definitely not what I want. So now I'm more part-time on the farm, but I still am involved with mainly the hog barn. That's where uh, what Jared and I run. And then we do have some cow-calf pairs, too. So during all this expansion into, into the hogs, uh, did, did they have to buy more land, or how did all that happen? No, we were fortunate that my dad had some um, acres he was willing to give up to build the two hog barns. They're not on the family farm, but they're within a mile of our farm. And then same with the feedlot, he gave up some crop acres around the farm and expanded there. Okay, great. Uh, I'm going to come back to you in, in just a minute. I want to get to Jared uh, Knock here uh, quickly. Um, Jared, what, what's driving your interest in, in livestock development these days? Tell, tell us a little bit about your operation. Sure. Um, so I went to school at SDSU, graduated in 2007. My wife and I, we got married. Uh, we both worked um, out of state. When we got married, we decided we wanted to come back to a small community, to a farm um, that we could be a part of. Made more sense for us to come back this way from opportunity standpoint than it did to go to herd, 
her folks' place in Iowa. So when we came back, I was coming back to what I call a one and a half family operation, meaning there's, there's more than enough work for one family, but only one set of income kind of thing, right? So uh, it was to the point where I thought that I felt like my parents might start cutting back, giving up some leased acres, some uh, cutting back on the cow herd potentially, or at least not growing uh, because they were kind of tapped out from their resource standpoint. And so the, the operation was either going to start, you know, continue to erode a little bit, which is going to make it that much harder to bring it back at some point, or there needed to be someone else around, but not someone every day, not someone that is, is taking payroll away from the operation, just someone there that can help uh, keep everything going, be there a few days a week, weekends, nights, uh, during peak time frame. So we moved back, we started a business that allowed us to basically create, uh, we're about 48 miles from a stoplight, and so the the options were either, you know, uh, develop a 45-minute commute, which means that I'd be gone roughly 11 hours a day then by the time it was all said and done, or create a job. So we created a business that uh, employs us and uh, that we really enjoy. Also allows us to be right next to my folks and help with their various livestock enterprises. So tell us about that business. Sure. Uh, the business that... Uh, so our business, uh, we sell uh, uh, seed, semen. Uh, we work with a lot of customers. We have customers in four or five states, but primarily people in a 100 to 150 mile radius, uh, crop and livestock genetics. Wow, kind of the uh, necessity, the mother of invention on that one, huh? Yeah, it was, it's been a lot of fun. It's, we're maybe one of the only like seed slash semen dealers around, but you know, most people need both if they have crops and cattle, <laughs> livestock, so, so that works. worked out. There's a common theme here. Uh, oh, did you have to, did you have to buy more land to make all this happen? No, actually, the, so the land footprint of, the, of my folks' operation, our operation has shrunk since I moved back. I actually lost some leased farm ground acres. So, you know, we have, uh, we farm 550, 600 acres tillable, that's it. We have pasture ground on top of that. But, uh, so the idea that you can turn that into, with enough livestock development, with, you know, custom finishing hogs, adding sheep into the equation, uh, increasing the cow herd, and, and doing some extra backgrounding things, that, the idea that you could turn that into a two-family operation uh, seems like a big stretch from what we're used to, but it's really possible. And if you adopt the model, you know, Derek brought up Sioux County, there's a lot of two-family, 500-acre farms in, in North Northwest Iowa that have enough livestock, feed enough livestock, feed enough hogs to, to really make that work. And so that's kind of, you know, hopefully the goal there is to, to turn that into something substantial without having to wait for the neighbors to retire or wait for the neighbors to get out of the business for you to grow. Oh, interesting lesson. So, so you have tapped into family connections. Have you seen people not have the family connection and still grow a livestock business? Is that possible? I, I, I know of a few people in Iowa that have done that. Some people that you know grew up at least two generations removed from an operation, have no family land, uh, lived in town, you know, got started in, uh, the examples I can think of the two are, are strictly in the hog business, but started with one finishing site, uh, grew to managing two or three others, has the opportunity, came around, bought them, and, and now, because they have access to manure and they've been using neighbor's ground, are working their way into starting to custom farm. And so I think you will see a few examples of, of someone that's gonna get into commodity ag that didn't have a background, but it was solely through livestock at first and then broadened out farther from there. Mm -hmm. Jump back to Adam here real fast. Can somebody do that? Can somebody make a livestock operation out of nothing? Yes and no. Um, I, th I think you can, but I think you need to be patient and make sure you do your homework ahead of time. For example, um, I think it's, it's not necessarily, your limiting factor isn't your, your smarts or, or learning with livestock. I think everybody um, who has a passion for animal well-being and, and a passion for animals can, can definitely deal with livestock. I think your most limiting factor, though, is the financial aspect. And that's something that, that takes time and patience to be able to, to overcome, to step into that role. Is it possible for someone to, to work on a farm and develop a relationship with someone who's not kin? Oh, absolutely. Um, you hear about, um, I've actually got a few classmates that I graduated with from, from South Dakota State that's... Um, that kind of joined another family operation, um, sort of as an apprenticeship, so to speak, and um, are gradually now moving into kind of a family farmer role, almost, almost as if they were part of that family. Mm -hmm. uh, Kevin, how about you? So back to your question, yeah. Uh, 
It's someone out of agriculture, they can get into livestock agriculture. Uh, just bringing in another example, I know of a young man who went to go work as just a general farm labor hand for another guy. And uh, he had cattle on that. And I, as the relationship grew there, so did uh, the hired man's uh, interest into the, into the farm. And so he's been able to uh, eventually add his own cattle. So I think there's definitely opportunity to be able to get into any type of livestock development. But as Adam said here, you just got to be diligent about what you hope to accomplish and how you're going to accomplish it. I mean, <clears throat> there's, there's no shortage of our love for working with animals, but there is shortage of other resources. Yeah. And we got to be able to make sure we know how to manage that from either already in it or wanting to come into it. There's a lot of <clears throat> possibility thinking <clears throat> on this panel, and I'd really like to see that. Uh, tell me, uh, Derek, a little bit about what you brought to your business. Everyone's, everyone talks about what they, what they brought, so what did you bring? Well, uh, when I went back, they, uh, <coughs> my two brother-in-laws actually, they didn't know the financial or the grain merchandising side or the commodity side of it basically everything my dad did and uh, when I went back they said you need to go in his office and uh, learn exactly what he does in case something bad would happen if he passed away or something like that and that's what I did and uh, as a result it's allowed me to learn a lot and now manage the company to what it is today and uh, continue to grow in the livestock business and the grain industry. Interesting. Tell me a little bit about uh, your communities. Um, are you comfortable, Adam, that, uh, that Clear Lake is on solid ground? Is it growing? Is it stable? Um, I guess I'd have to see. Uh, we have to wait for the census report for that one, I guess. But uh, I guess I'd say we're, we're fairly stable. Um, we're not growing by leaps and bounds by any means. Um, but Clear Lake is a, is a solid community right off the interstate with uh, right between Watertown and Brookings. So I'd say we're, we're a stable community. Okay. Pass it on down the line. Tell us about your community. Well, I live near Mount Vernon, which is just a short drive from Mitchell, South Dakota, only 10 miles. So there's, I don't say we're ever worried about our community being eliminated because we're such a short drive and people commute that far. But, you know, as a whole, our community is growing and, and people, but not, and also livestock, as we've had many uh, producers add different types of, of animal livestock to their operations. So it's a thriving community where I'm from. Interesting. And uh, Derek, how, are, how, are, how is your community in Minnesota? Uh, we have, you know, locations, five different locations. Um, if I think about uh, Edgerton, which is one of our locations, even Chandler, it looks a lot like the Lake Norton picture. Uh, it's hard to find a place to park on Main Street. Uh, Edgerton's got two car dealers. They've got two schools. Uh, they used to have two grocery stores, restaurants, um, and they're all busy. I mean, two hardware stores, insurance. Chandler's got insurance. I mean, it's only 10 miles away. And the uh, cool thing about Edgerton is it's uh, 1,000 people. And I think last year they built three new houses, which is a big, wow. big deal. Mm -hmm. Brooke, I've been to Scotland. It's a nice town. Yes. Is it thriving? Yeah. Um, I wouldn't say it's growing substantially, but it has the original poet ethanol plant. We're only a half hour from Yankton. And quite a few um, people my age, actually, in the couple of grades that were above me have moved back to start farming, even if they were separated a couple generations from the family farm, and that's exciting. We always joke that 10 years from now, we won't really be able to have a class reunion because we all will live within 10 miles of each other because we all moved back to farm. <laughs> Jared, tell me about, um, about, your, about Willow Lake. Where's that? <laughs> yeah, well, so it's about 75 miles northwest of here, but it's kind of the middle, you know, kind of middle of nowhere, east from South Dakota, about 45 miles to stoplight, town of a thousand people, like I said. So it's, uh, but 
I would say that there's some stabilization going on, but after a, a you know pretty steady 90-year decline in population, um, you know really compared to the 90s, yeah, we're probably doing okay. But uh, realistically, we've got a long ways to go to try and build that recovery. And you know, surprisingly, you know, Amazon just named their second headquarters, and Will Lake wasn't even in the top 10, which surprised everybody. <laughs> And, but the reality is, is that who's going to move here? Amazon's not coming to Will Lake. They're not coming to Scotland. They're not even Clear Lake or Mitchell, right? So what kind of development are we going to happen? What kind of things um, are going to be developed in our, our communities? And it's, it's, going to be, it's going to be livestock development, almost primarily. I mean, there's going to be other good things that come along with it. But, uh, but that's what we're good at. We, you know, in this part of the world, our agriculture is based on producing livestock and livestock feed. If we don't use the livestock feed here, we'll just send it to where we send our livestock. Yeah. So your, your approach to this is, is optimistic. It's, it's you know, we, we kind of have a down feeling about, about our small towns are dying, you mm -hmm. know. How can we change that? Well, I'm, I'm optimistic now, but I, I said culturally growing up in the late 80s, 90s, you know, early 2000s in, in small town South Dakota, now, I, I, I've, I've since kind of identified it as what I'd call scarcity mentality. And it was really everyone was just surviving after 20 to 25 years of, of, of really tough times, surviving. And I don't think anybody had hope that that the things that we were associated with were actually gonna grow on their own. Nobody thought anybody's gonna to move to this town or move to this area. Um, we were in a small farm that had questionable viability and in a small town that was dying and a school that was dying and a church that was dying and everything that we were a part of, it was an annual or, or monthly conversation of how long we're gonna last, how long before we're gone too. And when you're in that survival mode, I think that you start to think that, well, the way for the Will Lake School to exist is if we can just outlast Iroquois, and then we'll get some of their kids, you know, and, and from their district. And if we can outlast Henry, and it just becomes a game of survivor yeah. in rural South Dakota. And then, and then that transcends over into our farms too, because then the only way for our farm to grow and to be successful is for our neighbor to either go broke or retire. And so then you're sitting there waiting. And, and you're stuck in this box where you don't think the only way out for you is to take over someone and you get covetous in your heart and you become a bad neighbor and you become a bad citizen. And so then when, we, when I got out of that box and kind of went into saw Sioux, you know, Sioux County, Iowa, and I lived and worked there for several years, and I said, these people don't think that way. Um, they're competitive, but they think that how, how can they make what they have better, more efficient, more productive, more economical, rather than trying to sit around, you know, land costs $20,000 an acre there. No one's sitting around saying all I need to do is buy another section. You can't do it. You gotta make do with what you have. And so thinking of things from an abundance mentality, thinking what's good for me is good for my neighbor. What's good for the community is good for the next community, rather than trying to just wait it out and survive. Kevin, you got that optimistic abundance mentality? Well, I live in a little bit different situation where he's down the middle of nowhere. I'm actually kind of by an interstate, so that's... He's <laughs> got a nice Cabela's can, nearby. Yeah, yeah, you can keep it. <laughs> what I do, I, you know, people, I think, are, want to be back in a small community. I think we had that rush, like you said, out of the 90s, moving into larger communities, and then all of a sudden say, hey, we kind of missed that. You know, you're getting these generations that want to come back to these small communities just because it is what it is. It's small, it's friendly, and you know, we, all, we all come to the same school, little school, and we all want to prosper together. We all have that town spirit. And I think that has translated to our uh, rural community as well, where we all want to cheer for each other to, you know, hey, you got 200 bushel corn, so did I. Oh, awesome. Yeah. And I, I think that's even in our livestock, you know, hey, we all want to grow together, whether, say, that, that guy's starting to raise bulls. I want to support him, and I want, you know, support him because I know he's going to support me when I go sell my cattle. And, it's, and as we're trying, trying to change that mentality of trying to outpace each other and then kind of build on each other with each other. Mm -hmm. Great. In the leadership uh, class, we talk about social license to farms. I'm going to bell with folks. Actually, President Dunn was talking a lot about that. That is, yes, you can farm. But everybody seems to be making it difficult. You know, we have to prove that farming is okay. And uh, I, I know that uh, Brooke has some stories about uh, that type of transparency that President Dunn was talking about that, that, that allows you to, to expand your operation. Tell us about that. 
Yeah, so when Jared and I decided we were going to come back and farm and my dad was building his hog barns, we faced a lot of controversy and it was hard. Um, but we really made it our mission to end the disconnect between consumers and producers, especially in our county. And we made sure that while the hog barn was being built, we would take the um, builders to town and buy them lunch in town. We made sure to buy everything from the soap to shower in to just any, like everything you would need for the hog barn shower curtains. We bought that in town so we could show that building this hog barn was also supporting the small businesses in town. And uh, slowly we've seen that um, help us. And late, just recently, actually, the high school contacted us and asked if the ag class could come tour one of our hog barns. And my dad said, yes, definitely. So about 30 kids came out and we got the hazmat suits and we made sure they understood how particular the disease protocol is. And it was the coolest thing. The um, older gentleman who drove the bus out there, he um, drinks coffee uptown a lot. And he said, I've heard so many bad things about hog barns. And I'm just so happy I woke up today because this place, it's so clean. And those kids, they ask such good questions and their face just lit up and I've never seen a pig so clean. And my dad was like, that night at supper, we all sat down and he's like, this, this is it. This is what we're meant to do. We can spread um, positive information about agriculture and now he can go to coffee tomorrow and tell his friends that that's a good place, it's a good family operation. Wow, great story. Adam, you've got stories like that, right? Maybe not as good as that one. <laughs> that was but. pretty good, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> No, Brooke hit, uh, Brooke hit the nail on the head there. It's, uh, you know, with, through, uh, through a lot of my involvement with National Pork Board and South, South Dakota Pork Producers Council, um, it's, it's just all about telling your story, sending the message that, you know, <laughs> a lot of people have a bad connotation with, with pigs or livestock or manure. Mm -hmm. um, that's why we start to use certain words like pig farming rather than pork producer or field nutrients rather than manure, things like that. It just changes the connotation, but it also opens people's eyes to, to what, really, what, what we're really trying to do. And, and it all comes back to, um, like she said, supporting our communities and, and how can we um, make what we're doing be successful for not only ourselves, but our communities as well. Now, Derek, you have experience in five communities. Uh, how important is, uh, is shopping locally, if you want to put it that way? Uh, I'd say it's extremely important because um, that's your team behind your whole operation um, and you need to use them and support them and uh, if you work together the community will get better. Let's talk about the future. The future looks bright. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the average age of the U.S. farmer is getting older. Uh, we've been told that for a number of years and I think the opportunity ahead of us is it's huge, and uh, I agree with these guys. As young producers, we need to educate um, the consumer where this product is coming from, and you know that's a great story. And you know I think they'll buy into our operation like we have. So you have a 10-year plan, uh, Kevin. Tell us where where is your operation going in 10 years? Oh, 10 years, you know, in 10 years, we hope to, you know, obviously we don't hope to shrink. Uh, in 10 years, I, you know, we're going to have a lot of changes with my dad probably retiring and then my brother and I taking over the farm. So you start to think about that as how do you manage labor? Um, how are you going to manage your day-to-day -day operations and whatnot? And I, a lot of that, you know, as we see agriculture get more and more specialized and more and more you know, so precision, you know, uh, you learn in 10 years, you know, what can we use to operate with uh, minimal labor? And how are we going to use that precision type stuff, whether it be in our fields, uh, hog, you know, nutrient application, um, or even uh, feeding cattle? And how are we going to, if we can expand, how can we do that in the most efficient way possible? And that's, I think that's where we're going to go in 10 years. You know, how are we, we're going to probably manage the same amount of stuff, but do it better, do it more efficiently, and so that we can, uh, you know, not use as many people. Because, you know, like I said, when I came back, the, I was going to be the free labor. Well, <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't be free anymore, free labor, and I got to be able to, you know, how to use my labor to the best and use my time to the best that's available. Mm -hmm. Adam, do you see growing your livestock operation? 
Um, I guess I, I'm not as in depth in that with a with a 10 year plan, I guess, so to speak. But um, I mean, we're like like it was said earlier. There's there's a lot of conversations, hard conversations, um, but also futuristic conversations. Um, to be honest, we we look around the room and and I'm excited to see the finance panel um, to tell us what uh, interest rates and land prices are going to do. But uh, I don't think there's going to be a whole lot of change really, really soon. So, so right now, I guess for our operation, it's going to be kind of business as usual. Um, but also, like like that's been said on this panel, um, maybe expanding numbers wise as far as um, animals or acres isn't a possibility, but how can we make those animals or acres worth more through um, not only management practices, but the possibility of niche markets as well. Maybe adding value to that commodity, making it more specialized, um, things like that. So always having those conversations, um, keep reading the news, see what, see what the new buzz is with, uh, with consumers and, and see how you and your operation can, can maybe capitalize on that. Jared, can you give us a glimpse at the future? Uh, so, so personally for us, uh, we're going to continue to, to feed hogs. It's been a, a great income diversification for us, uh, and it helps us stabilize a lot of the other markets that can go up and down in our operation, cattle, sheep, uh, crops. Uh, I think that our best opportunity to improve in the next 10 years is going to be through more intense grazing management, and I probably had wanted to get to that earlier. Um, I, I think that's something we really need to focus on in the next five to eight years, which is a part of livestock development. We plan to hopefully run more cattle on the same amount of acres by more intense management. And that's what it all is, whether it's a hog barn or a, a grazing paddock system or whatever it might be. And I think that probably the, the biggest area we're going to expand is probably in sheep production. I think the profit potential and the models look really good there. And and uh, I, I'm a little worried about the robustness of the packing industry and price transparency, but I think that there is, uh, you know, we're more protein deficient on lamb than we are any other major or minor um, meat species. We import 64% of the lamb consumed in the country, and we have a fourth of the ewes that we did after World War II. And so there's a real need there, and I, we started getting into sheep when I was in college because when I started in college in 2002, to, and it took me five years because I did some other fun things along the way. Some were sanctioned, some weren't. And then, but when I would have started farming in 2008, had I gone right back to school or after school, the price of farmland in my area tripled while I was getting an education, right? And so I'm sitting there as junior, senior in the AGR house, Adam, you know, so going, we're all going, what the heck are we going to do? And so if you're wondering what the heck am I going to do, you know, find $10,000, you know, get a partner, get a loan, whatever it might be, go buy 100 short-term ewes, borrow the neighbor's square baler, dust off the five-gallon pails and get to work. And, and you can find existing housing and resources to do that. So, you know, livestock development looks like a lot of things. And, you know, when there's some people were out the other day looking at what we were doing, yeah, we have a modern, you know, you know confinement hog barn, uh, finishing barn. But we're also taking a 97-year-old hip-roofed wooden barn right now and reinforcing the sidewalls, sheet tinning the whole thing for a new lambing facility, which is also livestock development, and hoping to grow our ewe flock by a couple hundred head and, and, and see which model, you know, kind of flushes out from there. Wow. I'm going to open it up for questions. If you want to come forward just to a microphone, if you have questions for our young leaders and agribusiness people on this panel, come on down, as they say on the TV show. I'll start the ball rolling with one. If there were one thing that you think would make a huge difference in livestock operation in South Dakota right now, what would it be? I can speak yep. to this. Um, I think that this is something that my family's dealt with a lot um, in making a big difference in livestock operations is succession planning and bringing on the next generation to the farm. Our situation was a little unique. My dad's pretty young. He's only 45, so my grandpa's still not retired. So the next generation coming onto the farm would be Jared and I going onto my grandparents' farm. And it's it's hard. He, um, he made it through the 80s. He loves his farm and he just does not want to leave. Every year he says, this is the year. And then at the end of the year, it's another year. And uh, Jared and I, we've done our part and um, gone to some classes with my dad, but my grandpa, he's just not ready. He doesn't want to go to the classes. He doesn't want to um, just think about having to leave the farm. So I think that um, something that would be great for young producers and the older generations is just going and doing succession planning and making sure that that farm stays in the family. It seems that in each case here at the table, there's been a lot of success with that. Uh, 
what, what did you call it, Adam, the, the hard talk, or was that Kevin's word? Yeah, they, they're having the hard talk, and it, uh, and it works out. Questions from the floor? Um, anything to add? When you, when you talked about, oops, I'm sorry. But, um, and when you talked about one, th one thing that could change positively for the future of livestock development, this isn't just a South Dakota thing, but I think if we could change the conversation to understand that to start looking at manure as a resource instead of a pollutant, I think it's extremely damaged what we're trying to do. And the reality is, is if, you, if you wanted to make the shift, you know, in the ideologies of some to the perfect system, the organic system, the only nutrient that you can use is manure, right? Because it's the most natural, it's the longest existing. It's either that or, or you, know, peat, you know, peat bogs, you know, or, or bat guano, which is also manure. But, I mean, that's the only sources of fertilizer we have outside of using natural gas to condense air into nitrogen pellet form and then shipping it in from 10,000 miles away. Well, I guess there's one North Dakota plant, sorry. But anyway, it's, it's the most sustainable form of nutrient that we can apply to our crop fields. And so, but we regulate it as a pollutant instead of looking at it as a resource or an asset. And I, I don't know how to do that, but we've got to make the change to start looking at compost and manure as an enormous benefit rather than a detriment. Yeah. This, this is part of that transparency discussion. This, this uh, uh, you know, as, as, as the average consumer gets further and further away from, from knowledge of the farm, and you guys are on the front line, uh, you're gonna have to pick up the ball for the story that, that uh, has slipped away, the, the story that we now, have to, we now have to bring front and center. The consumer has a right to know. They wanna know where their food comes from. And we have a great story to tell about that, don't we? Thoughts? Yeah, I think that's, as a younger generation, I think that's where we can add the most value to some of our products is telling our story and kind of molding that public perception. I'm saying molding, but just informing them. You know, as the generations have gotten farther and farther away from the farm, so has what they know about the farm. You know, as Brooke said, she had a local bus driver. I'm sure he drove bus for Scotland for how many years? And he just went into a modern hog facility and his mind was blown and changed. You know, if if you think just in Scotland that happens, what, what do you think people think in larger cities and whatnot? And if we can tell our story, you know, and, you know like I said, as a younger generation with, with the technology we use, if we can share that story and just, you know, maybe change a few minds here or there or have some of those conversations with people, because there's people that want to know what we do and how we do it. And we have great stories to tell. And we have great operators out there that do great things. And if we can tell that story, we can change that public perception and just let them know what we do and you know how else we can add value to our product other than domestically you know and if we can do that i think there's a lot of opportunity there great other comments go ahead adam i'd just like to touch on something else that um, jared mentioned um he said a word that I think gets thrown around a lot, but no one really knows truly what it means, and I still don't, called sustainability. Um, a lot of us might have a conversation with a producer versus a consumer, and one will say, yes, this is sustainable. Um, the other one says it, it isn't. It isn't sustainable. And maybe that's just because we have alternating definitions of the word. Um, so I'm going to share with you. I'm, don't coin this term. I didn't come up with it. I'm just repeating it. But... Someone once told me that the best way to define sustainability, first of all, it has to make sense economically. Because if it doesn't make sense economically, um, they're gonna run out of capital to make it happen. Second, it's got to be environmentally friendly. And third, it's gotta be socially acceptable. So if you can make all those three things work, then you can call it sustainable, and, um, and you can keep the ball rolling with that, with that good conversation of sustainability. Mm -hmm. Other than uh, Brooke's comment about um uh, her experience with, with neighbors. Anyone else have neighbor, let's say problems? Let's keep it on the positive. Good, good relation stories to tell? I, I think that I live in a, in a fairly pro-ag county and I think there's been a lot of success with people being able to permit livestock facilities. And one of the things I would suggest for someone that's looking to do that um, is if you, at all possible, your, your chances of getting approved are gonna increase t drastically if you do two things. If you build it so you're the closest person to it, you know, if, if it's you know, closer to you than it is to any other neighbor, don't try and put it on your farthest piece of ground away from you towards somebody else. 
And if, if at all possible, do something that, that, that you're a part of, that you're going in the barns every day and, and, and doing some labor on it. If you do those two things, your chances of getting approval from the neighborhood, I think, go up dramatically, drastically. And, I, and so try and you know, abide by those things, I guess, if, if at all possible. Well, I want to thank our panelists today, uh, Jared, Brooke, Derek, Kevin, and Adam. You guys are terrific, and uh, let's hear it for our panelists. Now comes the fun time when uh, you can come up to them individually and uh, uh, ask all the questions you, uh, you'd like to. Thank you all very much.